Well, that, that is, is absolutely true, and I, Kent knows I, I took, he told that joke, and I, I took that joke and modified it to, uh, uh, to suit the purpose of the presentation, so I've always appreciated that. Uh, that, that church is not in the televised version of the show, though. <laughs> it got left on the cutting room floor. <laughs> but uh, uh, I want to I reintroduce two people because they're very special this presentation. You heard Linda Midget and Kathy Berry. Uh, introduced sitting with CC today, but uh, really the three of us were kind of the team that put this together. Kathy had worked for me, as many of you know, for every year that I was in elected office and had since retired, but uh, came back to help with some of the research for the program and, and help us select uh, photos for the coffee table book that is for sale uh, in connection with the show. And Linda, of course, is the executive producer at LPB, and she's the real brains behind the television version of this. Uh, the, the presentation I do live is pretty much me talking for three hours and a lot of music, and you can't do that in TV. You have to have other things, and Linda was really the genius behind putting other things together. So I'm glad some of you have seen it. Uh, uh, it's going to be on again on March 1st and 2nd, uh, 7 to 9 on LPB, so you'll be able to see it again. Somebody asked me, how do I get a copy of it? DVDs are for sale uh, when you watch the show, as is the coffee table book, which is a whole other story that we, we did during the course of the year uh, with a, a fascinating photographer uh, who has traveled around the country documenting the states, and all of her work is dedicated to the Library of Congress, so everybody in the world can have access to the 100,000-plus photographs she's taken. And all the photographs that are in the book that accompanies the presentation are available uh, free, and free of charge. So that's a nice little, little add-on. But um, it was a, a lot of fun to put this together. And so let me dispel one myth right at the outset. Not a put down on Mississippi at all. Uh, could have called it Why Louisiana Ain't Missouri, Why Louisiana Ain't New Jersey, but just sounded better, Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi. And the answer to that is pretty simple. We have, for a couple of reasons, we have no ethnic majority in Louisiana. About 40% of us are white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, about 32% are African American, and 28% are everything else. Uh, primarily French, Spanish, uh, Creole, living predominantly in South Louisiana, and Catholic. Uh, and that's what makes us unique, as well as the fact that the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf of Mexico through only one state, ours. And it, it creates a lot of economic opportunities for us and a lot of identity uh, and significance for the state of Louisiana. Um, so what I wanted to do today was not tell you what's in the show. Some of you have already seen it, and some of you may hopefully watch it another week or two. So I'm going to go over some things that literally got left on the cutting room floor, some things that uh, I would like to have had in the show, but we just didn't have time in all the four hours. But before I do that, I'm going to show you about a five-minute uh, clip of highlights uh, from the show. You'll recognize some faces in here that are actually in this room uh, that, are, that are part of the presentation. Here I am picking up the body of the President of the United States 
laying him on the table and helping get dried blood off of him. It's so important when we feel that people understand the reality and the truth of plantations. They were brutal places. And there were also places where um, African American culture was created, those bonds were continued and in some form. So we want to make sure that when people visit plantations that they are getting the full experience, especially from people that were enslaved and who, who labored here. Not a lot of people in Louisiana are going to believe that we have a buffalo herd right here in our state. So we do. People, they really don't realize that many of us out here. There's four federally recognized within the state of Louisiana. And um, down here in the corner of southwest Louisiana is a lot of people. And a lot of times that's just forgotten. If you mean that drink, the sale of which pours into our treasury, I told millions of dollars to provide the tender care we need. Our little crippled children, our deaf, our dumb, our blind, our pitiful, aged, and infirm, to build highways, hospitals, and schools, well, certainly I'm for it. This is my stand. I will not retreat. I will not compromise. <laughs> How did you kind of get that stock that's so full flavored? And I'm going to put just enough for this stock to absorb the root. Chef, when the world thinks about gumbo, they think it's a Cajun dish or a Creole dish. It's really a dish that's representative of everybody who's come to a new world through Louisiana. Well, and that's why we kind of call the Louisiana population our gumbo. If you didn't know how to make meatballs by the time you were five years old, maybe you're not Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I said the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the pot really begins to boil. Do you remember when you were given the name the Soul Queen of New Orleans? Because you're in Louisiana and excited that you're back. This is the only place where people at the airport will gather around their TV to watch a college baseball game. <laughs> it feels to me like people should know more about your contribution to Louisiana history. I'm kind of a big deal. There's a disproportionate impact on music and sports and the arts for our size and for our population. The impact Louisiana made on the world is, is unparalleled. How do we do? All right, well, you recognize uh, Richard, of course. Yep. Uh, part of the story we're trying to tell was about the fascinating mix of cultures that have come to America through the port of New Orleans and settled in Louisiana, but also the disproportionate impact that a state our size, uh, about midway in population in America, has had on so many different aspects of American life uh, and how we've influenced or been a part of so many special moments like what Richard was able to experience. So uh, I want to go through a couple of things for you that, that uh, didn't make the show. And I start with sports uh, because sports is a big part of our lives. And one of the things I hate is that there is no Pete Maravich in the show. Uh, and, and that was because we had to really go through what we're going to do to force everything into four hours, and we were going to put Pete where we talked about basketball, because there's a lot of talk about basketball, or we're going to put him where I talk about the Serbs um, or the influence of Croatians on Louisiana, because Maravich, they're, for generations, are viches and sons of viches that have been oyster growers <laughs> in Baton Rouge, and Maravich was one of those important ones, but we couldn't fit him in there, and I hated that. Um, Louisiana, a Louisianan and an adopted Louisianan, uh, are the names on two of the most significant war, uh, awards in sports. The NFL Coach of the Year is named for Eddie Robinson from Baton Rouge, coach to Grambling. Uh, and the NCAA Coach of the Year in Baseball is named for our adopted son, Skip Bertman. Didn't mention any of the sports casters, the impact that Louisiana's had on the sports casting world. When you think about names you're going to recognize, obviously Tim Brando, 
Bryant and Greg Gumbel, both from New Orleans. And if you watch television sports nowadays, ESPN, SEC Network, all of what you see, you got Marcus Spears, you got Booger McFarland, you got Ryan Clark, all of the analysts. Um, Terry Bradshaw has been at it for quite a while, obviously from Shreveport. Um, Kaylee Hartung from Baton Rouge, now a, a female commentator. Um, and an interesting little tidbit, if you watch the NFL, and I know many of you in this room do, and you hear these expert referees now, now we've got commentators that are referees that tell you what the flag ought to look like. Terry McCauley, you recognize Terry McCauley's name, a Louisiana, grew up in Hammond, and not actually born here, but grew up in Hammond, went to Southeastern, graduated from LSU, lives in North Louisiana now. He is one of the deans of, of NFL officiating and is one of the main uh, folks on TV you'll see him today. Speaking of the NFL, the NFL gives an award, the NFL Man of the Year. It's been given every year. Uh, most recently, it's been named after Walter Payton since about the year 2000. Since 2000, there have been 22 winners, NFL Man of the Year. Five of them are Louisianans. Peyton Manning, Eli Manning, uh, Warwick Dunn from here in Baton Rouge, and the last two winners in a row. If you watch the Super Bowl, Andrew Whitworth, and Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott's from Houghton in North Louisiana. So the NFL Man of the Year, two years in a row, has been a native Louisiana. Uh, and I mentioned Pete, uh, all-time leading scorer in basketball history, but this is one of the little fascinating tidbits that didn't make the cut. The all-time leading scorer in American high school basketball is a guy named Greg Procell, who played from, for Ebarb in northwestern part of the state, same vintage time I, John Inquist and I were playing at Baton Rouge High in the 1970s. I remember him well. We didn't play against him. He is the all-time leading scorer in, in American high school basketball history. Number two and number three are from the same area as Greg Procell. It's about a 100-mile area. You draw a circle around, and the top three scorers all time in high school basketball are Louisianans. You, some of you may remember a guy's name, Bruce Williams. He went to play at Florine. Jackie Moreland, an older guy from Minden, Louisiana, played at Louisiana Tech. Uh, pretty, a pretty impressive um, impact on, on the world of sports, not to mention what you'll see in the show. We really didn't have time to delve into uh, Louisiana literature as much as I would have liked to. We have Ernest Gaines in the show. We have my favorite, James Lee Burke, in the show. Uh, but listen to some of the authors from Louisiana who deserve mention in a show like this, but who have had, again, a disproportionate impact on, on American literature. T. Harry Williams, Robert Penn Warren, both professors at LSU uh, for long periods of time. Um, Arna Bonton was a leader of the Harlem Renaissance Movement in New York, a Louisianan. Kate Chopin, one of the first female writers who was actually had the audacity to write about liberation of females, of women, is a Louisianan. Rebecca Wells from Alexandria wrote Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, which I'm sure some of you or your wives have read or heard about. Uh, Helen Prejean wrote the book Dead Man Walking that became an in, a very famous movie. And Robert Harling wrote and directed um, Steel Magnolias, which was long before we had a movie tax credit in Louisiana, was a very impactful movie on American society. And those are just the ones who didn't grow up in New Orleans. Listen to the list of folks who are from New Orleans in the literary world. Walter Isaacson, in modern day, fabulous writer. Uh, Tennessee Williams and Walker Percy both spent a lot of time in New Orleans writing. Truman Capote is a New Orleans native. Anne Rice, Vamp uh, Interview with the Vampire. Koki Roberts, John Kennedy Toole, who wrote Confederacy of Dunces, which if you hadn't read it, you gotta read it if, read it if you're a Louisiana, and it's, it's tremendous. Um, Stephen Ambrose, obviously, the D-Day books and all those great historical books. And Michael Lewis, who wrote Moneyball and Blindside, all those contemporary books about sports, is a, is a New Orleans native. And I wish we could have gone into the, a little bit more detail about, about Louisiana's impact on, on the literary world. We do have a book, as I make a shameless plug for this coffee table book, which you can purchase and help LPB, which, by the way, gets all the proceeds from, from what we've done. Uh, but the coffee table book was kind of an add-on to what we were doing. Uh, Linda knew of a lady named Carol Highsmith, who is also going to be the subject of a, of a documentary herself, uh, the lady who's traveled around the country documenting America. And 
we asked her if she'd like to do a book about Louisiana and everything kind of fell into place and we said, let's just make it a, an adjunct to why Louisiana ain't Mississippi. So Carol spent most of the time last year traveling around the state, photographing Louisiana. I wrote the, the book, the, the copy, really just the cut lines for the book and an introduction. Uh, but it's a beautiful coffee table book and we just wanted you to see a little bit about Carol's perspective on doing that. The, the picture of Mike the Tiger is really unbelievable. It's a double truck in the book, and uh, actually there are four of those prints that are for sale as well for supporting LPB, and uh, if you're a Tiger fan, you're going to want to get the Mike the Tiger, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a fabulous picture. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the show is all about Louisiana names because our last names reflect the huge diversity and ethnicity uh, that makes Louisiana different, and we got a lot of names in the show but we got a lot of names that got left out of the show as well. I'm gonna give you a couple perspectives on, on people who you see, name tags here at the Rotary Club or beyond. Uh, this is in the show, this one little excerpt. Uh, if you see names like Sheck Snyder, Wagaspak, Haydell, Oob, Miller, Emel, Trish, Vicknair, Toops, Lambert, Poche, Zerang, they are the, what? The Germans who came to Louisiana, most of whom settled in the outside of New Orleans and Lac des Almonds in the Des Almonds area, the Lake of the Germans. Um, they all think they're Cajuns because they've been, uh, they've morphed into the Cajun society, but when you have those last names, their roots are essentially uh, from Germany. Um, the Irish have a significant influence as well. They came in the mid-1850s or so, or 1840s to, uh, to Louisiana, and had a huge impact on politics, particularly in New Orleans. In the early, late 60s and early 70s, before we had single member districts, before we voted based upon a small geographical part that you were in, and you got to pick from somebody in that area, we elected legislators at large. And in the early 1970s, New Orleans was represented by two Casey's, an O'Brien, an O'Keefe, a McGittigan, and a Sullivan. All Irish surnames, all representing, that was the New Orleans delegation. If you were an Irish, you weren't gonna represent New Orleans. Uh, there's a huge uh, Sig Sicilian influence. Uh, Kathy, in the, in the uh, show you saw, she said, well, you're not Italian if you can't kick a, cook a meatball uh, by the time you're five years old. Well, the people who came to Louisiana weren't Italians because Italy didn't exist yet. They were Sicilians when they first came in the mid-1850s. New Orleans was the largest Sicilian population city in America. 
Chicago was second at the time. That's all changed with Ellis Island. But uh, the Sicilians who came to Louisiana got off the boat in New Orleans with these long, multi-syllabic, multi-voweled names that nobody could understand. And so the clerk who welcomed these people basically identified where they were from by looking at the manifest of the ship. And so Pietro, whatever his last name was, became Peter Palermo because he was from Palermo on the ship uh, manifest. And that's the way a lot of the surnames that you see in Louisiana today uh, were manifested. That's in the show. What would, did not make the show and is particularly of interest, I think, to those of us who call Baton Rouge home is this. If you want to take nourishment in the greater Baton Rouge area, you are going to buy food and drink products from a wholesale or retail company that is owned by, operated mostly still today, by a Bologna, a Christiana, a Crefasi, a Di Vincenti, a Farashi, a Cora, a Manda, a Montalbano, or a Pizzolatto. <laughs> and that's the, that's the Sicilian, Italian influence on how we get nourished in, in South Louisiana. Um, if you uh, are from, well, the little small country, relatively small country of Lebanon has made a significant impact in Louisiana, particularly on politics. There are probably less than about 5,000 Lebanese families in Louisiana, but listen to the names that you'll recognize from Louisiana politics. Ayub, Akal, Reggie, Mansour, Bustani, Shahardi, Abraham, Hike, and a doctor named Debakey. Those are all Lebanese names, all primarily from the southwest corner of Louisiana that have had a profound impact on, on Louisiana politics. Now, in the show I mentioned that back when we had phone books, um, I used to look through phone books. We didn't really have them anymore, but in, you know, about 10 years ago, phone books were still pretty common. And in doing some research, Kathy and I would look at phone books to kind of figure out numbers of people who were in certain areas. Um, and this little part is in the show, but I think it, it's interesting, so I'll mention it. If you know somebody who is named Bordelon, Coco, Cuvillon, Dozad, Decelle, Grimion, Laborde, Lemoyne, Mayu, Moreau, Roy, Rabelais, or Tassan, write it down. They're from Avoyles Parish, or from somebody in their immediate families from Avoyles Parish. And if you're at the same meeting or seeing a name tag that somebody says they're a Fontenot, or a Foray, or a Lafleur, or a Swallow, or a Vadrine, they're from Evangeline Parish, Ville Platte. And there are hardly any Labors in Evangeline Parish, and there's hardly any Fontenot's in Lavoie's Parish. It's like the Berlin Wall between those two, but, <laughs> but don't ask me why, but that's the case. Um, um, let's see, what else I want to tell you in the time I have. Um, oh, um, the epicenter of Broussards in the world is Abbeville, Louisiana. In the Abbeville phone book, a town of about 12,000 people. One out of every 30 listings was a Boudreaux. I'm sorry, it was a Broussard, not a Boudreaux, a Broussard. And it used to be in the clerk's office there. I did a little work in the clerk's office years and years ago, and you walk into the clerk's office where they file all the records, and the filing cabinets were A, B, Broussard, C, D, E, <laughs> and a whole filing cabinet. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time, so let me, let me uh, you saw in the show, a little clip, the, the animation, the, the animation with the mouth. Well, that was done by Bill Joyce. Bill Joyce is an Academy Award winner from Shreveport, Louisiana. He uh, had a great little uh, book, uh, won it for animated shorts, uh, short films, the fantastic flying books of Mr. Morris Lesmore a few years ago. And we got Bill to do animation uh, in the show, and that was one example of it. I'm going I'm to tell you how it fits in, and this is in the show, but this is how I'll... I'll conclude, uh, that animated uh, face that you saw accompanies me telling the, the story of the one time I leave Louisiana to, to, tell, to talk about any other place. And we actually go to Mississippi. And we go to Mississippi because back in the 1950s, Mississippi was dry. You could not sell liquor in Mississippi. Some counties had quietly legalized it, were making a lot of money selling bootleg whiskey, but the legislature was called into session to decide whether or not to legalize whiskey or not. And they had a big, conf a big uh, banquet, the opening night of the session, like they'd be here. Well, all the legislators were here, all the pros, we should legalize it, all the antis, we shouldn't legalize it, were all present. And a leader of the Mississippi legislature was a guy named uh, Noah Sweat. His nickname was Soggy, Soggy Sweat. 
Soggy Sweat was called upon to address the crowd that night and to give them the definitive answer whether or not whiskey should be legalized or not. And this is what he said when we got up and addressed the crowd. Uh, the best example I know of of a politician talking out of both sides of his mouth. This is what uh, Soggy Sweat said. He said, I had not intended to take a position on such a controversial issue at this time, but I never, ever, ever shy away from controversy. And you've asked me how I feel about whiskey. I'll tell you how I feel about whiskey. If when you say whiskey, you mean the devil's brew, the poison scourge, the bloody monster that defiles innocence, dethrones reason, destroys the family, yea, literally takes bread from the mouths of little children. If you mean that evil drink that topples a Christian man and woman from the pinnacle of righteous, gracious living into the bottomless pit of degradation and despair and shame and helplessness and hopelessness, certainly I'm against it. But if when you say whiskey, you mean oil of conversation, <laughs> the philosophic wine, the ale that is consumed when good fellers gather together puts a song in their heart, laughter on their lips, and the warm glow of contentment in their eyes. If you mean Christmas cheer, if you mean that stimulating drink puts a springing old gentleman's step on a frosty, crispy morning, if you mean that drink that enables a man to magnify his joy and happiness and forget if only for a moment life's heartaches and sorrows and tragedies, if you mean that drink, the sale of which pours into our treasury untold millions of dollars to provide the tender care we need for our little crippled children, <laughs> our deaf, our dumb, our pitiful aged and infirm to build highways and hospitals and schools, by God, I'm for it. <laughs> this is my stand. I will not retreat. I will not compromise. <laughs> he could get elected in Louisiana.